Can I have your attention, please? If one person at every table would ring their glass, then we'll, we'll, we'll be convened. Thank you. OK. Before we start with the speeches this afternoon, we have a series of recognitions. And I particularly want to recognize the people who actually organized this conference. Everybody says Doug and Joel and Jim did all the work, and we did work hard. But I promise you, we would not be sitting in this room today if it were not for our Sarah Elder from the Chesapeake Conservancy, Lolita Ross, our consultant, and Sean Johnson from the University of Montana. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah. All right, I have one little housekeeping thing to announce. In session F72, where Lynn Scarlett and other people are going to discuss the LCCs and the LCC Council. Lynn's part in that presentation will happen at 3.15 rather than 3.55, so that the people who are rushing to the airport have an opportunity to hear what Lynn has to say about this very important council. Now, before we start recognizing the people in this room who have done such important work, just a couple of them, I want to remember someone who isn't with us anymore, who, if you're, if you're on the front lines, if you're really working hard on large landscape conservation across agencies, you will recognize. So can I have that picture, please? This is Nancy Natoli. Nancy was a very good friend of mine, and she worked for the Department of Defense on the REPI program. Nancy passed away uh, fairly recently of cancer. And her daughter wrote all of her friends, all of Nancy's friends, and said, thank you for all your good wishes. What my mother would want me to say to you is to tell your children to go outside and play. I want to read you something that we wrote in Nancy's memory. Nancy Natoli was a rare and remarkable public servant. She put her heart, soul, and creativity into the task of preparing soldiers for their duties and at the same time finding innovative ways to protect America's land and biodiversity. Nancy was both funny and smart. She was both caring and sharply analytical. When you had the chance to talk with Nancy, she gave you her full, undivided attention and made you feel that your conversation was the most important thing she could possibly be doing at that moment. I hold enormous personal and professional respect for the work she did and can only hope that those who follow Nancy will hold her example of professionalism as a standard of excellence that they will strive to meet. So we don't need any applause, but I'm going to hold you all to the standard of excellence that Nancy Natoli set. OK. I have the great pleasure now of interest, introducing to you Steve Gurton, who is the deputy director of the Fish and Wildlife Service for policy. In the spirit of today's lunch, which is largely about how the Department of Defense focuses on land conservation, it is most appropriate that Steve went to Norwich University in Vermont, which is a military school, as I understand it, and was a Marine Corps lieutenant. I've only recently met Steve, but I've watched tapes on the internet of his taking blistering fire 
from uh, people on Capitol Hill who might not agree with him on everything. He is cool, he is calm, he is articulate. Uh, he is also an outstanding public servant. Let me introduce Steve Gurton. Well, thank you all for the opportunity to meet with you this afternoon. This is a very impressive gathering, five, 600 people. How many of you from out of town? How are you liking that traffic and that, that metro crowding? You know, it's all a matter of perspective. This past weekend, our youngest is in the Cub Scouts, and we took the pack down to Poet Bay Regional Park, part of the great Chesapeake Bay landscape. We had 30 boys, first through fifth grades, running around the woods with pocket knives and hatchets and bonfires, and their, their lips were rimmed with chocolate from s'mores and cocoa. And I'm here to tell you, I found a lot of tranquility on the metro this week, just <laughs> sitting there. And I understand we have a lot of people here from Montana, so I want to talk to you guys after the conference. I've got some very young men looking for a wilderness adventure for several months next summer. We want to send them out there so the rest of us can get a good night's sleep for once it sounds. So again, thank you for being here. It's no secret that we in the conservation community face challenges of staggering scale and complexity. Global climate disruption, growing water scarcity, widespread habitat loss and fragmentation, to name just a few. None of us, including the US Fish and Wildlife Service, can meet these challenges alone, nor can we be successful by doing what worked in the last century. We have to focus our resources where they will provide the greatest conservation benefit, where we will get the best return for taxpayer dollars, the best return on our investment for the greatest number of species at landscape scale. This conference may be the largest gathering of leaders and practitioners of large landscape conservation to date, and the power emanating from this room could be felt coming into the building. So it's a great honor to be here and We'll all be living off the vibe and the energy for years to come. Many of your organizations have undergone significant changes, and we're all here to learn and to find better ways to work with you. And as we do so, we celebrate the anniversaries of two pioneering initiatives that showed how large landscape conservation is possible through collaboration, hard work, and big dreams. The first is the 20th anniversary of the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative. What began as a visionary effort to demonstrate the value of the vast mountain ecosystem stretching from Yellowstone National Park to the Yukon is now grounded in 125 active partnerships that steward the region's natural resources. Over the last 20 years, protected public land in the Yellowstone to Yukon region has doubled to 20%. Y2Y serves as a global model of non-governmental-led large landscape conservation. 2014 also marks the 30th anniversary of the National Heritage Area Program. In 1984, President Ronald Reagan signed legislation creating the 96-mile Illinois and Michigan Canal Corridor, a revolutionary public-private partnership that engaged local communities to preserve their heritage and tell their story to the nation. Recent studies have shown that this living landscape approach is a cost-effective way to deliver cultural and natural resource conservation, recreational opportunities, and community development. Today, there are 49 national heritage areas stretching from Florida to Alaska. With us today are some of the leaders of these trailblazing ideas. I will ask them to stand so we can recognize them for their work. 
from the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative, David Johns, who practices law and policy at Portland State University. David is currently a Y2Y board member and was the founder and first executive director of the Wildlands Project. Charles Chester, a longtime Y2Y board member and professor of global Envir environmental politics. He's written extensively about transboundary conservation efforts. Gary Tabor, an early adopter and former Y2Y board member who is a mentor for many large landscape conservation efforts. Is Gary here? And he's the founder of the Center for Large Landscape Conservation. Wendy Francis is Y2Y's program director. We understand she is here as well. Her experience ranges from grassroots conservation to organizational leadership. From the National Heritage Areas Program, I want to recognize Jerry Edelman, President and CEO of Open Lands, a land conservation organization in Northeastern Illinois. Jerry coordinated efforts that led to the creation of the very first National Heritage Areas, the Illinois and Michigan Canal Corridor. In addition, he's been a leader in open space conservation and historic preservation of the Chicago region and indeed around the world. And Alan Sachs is the president of the Alliance of National Heritage Areas. Is Alan here? The former director of the Delaware and Lehigh National Heritage Corridor in Pennsylvania and instrumental in establishing Pennsylvania's successful heritage area program. Also with us today are additional leaders from national heritage areas across the country Angie Carlino from the Rivers of Steel. <laughs> Annie Harris from Essex National Heritage Area. <laughs> Dan Rice from the Ohio and Erie Canalway. <laughs> Dayton Cherus from Augusta Canal National Heritage Area. and Martha Raymond from the National Park Service. Thank you all for showing us the way. We also wanted to take a, a few minutes to reaffirm the outstanding opportunities we in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service share with you about thinking bigger and working to connect the landscape in meaningful ways. As you know, together, We've all created a network of 22 landscape conservation cooperatives building on existing partnership-driven conservation efforts like joint ventures under the North American Waterfowl Management Plan. We're using science to drive conservation where it can make the most significant impacts at a landscape scale. And more importantly, this is not a theoretical exercise for us where we just want to do good to do good. Instead, the Fish and Wildlife Service and other agencies in the administration are actually driving conservation dollars toward where these funds can make the most significant impacts. We've done that in our own agency by prioritizing 70% of the receipts we collect from the sale of annual duck stamps and prioritize that funding to get ahead of the conservation challenges in the prairie pothole region. We in the administration and the state of Montana, the Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, prioritize funding for the crown of the continent to bundle funding and make a landscape scale difference, largely for grizzly bear conservation under landscape cooperatives and the president's budget. And I know the secretary had a hard sell here yesterday getting you to get behind this idea of full funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund. We're seeing the federal agencies and indeed the administration driving dollars in areas like Gulf Coast restoration where we have the science that shows us where we can make the most significant impacts as well as all of our work in areas like Hurricane Sandy restoration where we're right now designing and building 
the coastlines and wetlands of the future. That's what we're all about here today, and that's what the Fish and Wildlife Service reaches out to you in partnership with the other federal agencies to rally around these landscape conservation cooperatives as a great model for landscape scale conservation. I also have the honor of getting to introduce our next speaker. And it, as Jim mentioned, I'm a former second lieutenant. Uh, and so it gives me great honor to now introduce senior leadership from Department of Defense. We all know and appreciate the important mission the Department of Defense holds on our behalf. You may not realize it, but in order to provide adequate training for our warfighters, the Department of Defense manages an $850 billion real property portfolio, which encompasses more than 500 installations, 500,000 buildings and structures, and more than 28,000 acres. From the Fish and Wildlife Service perspective, we know how vital these properties can be for conservation. We work with DOD on integrated natural resource management plans, species recovery, and connectivity issues. To tell us more about the critical role the Department of Defense plays, we are so pleased to have the Honorable John Conger, the man who leads these efforts for defense, as our next speaker. Let's give him a large landscape welcome. How are we all doing? Now, everybody's eating already. Everybody should be happy. You're getting your coffee and your dessert. Now you get to listen to me. Um, it, it is not intuitively obvious, I imagine, uh, what the Defense Department has to do with what you all do. Um, what the, the whole idea of conservation from the perspective of the Defense Department is a, um, well, it's very important to us, and I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit today about about the the linkage. I um I have this speech that my uh, my staff put together. I'm not going to read it. Don't worry. Um, but there are a couple things that, that, that the reason these are useful is because it, it reminds you a couple of things you got to do during the course of your remarks, and not just to jump into the meat of everything. Um, I, I want to say thank you to a couple folks. Uh, first to Jim Levitt uh, for, for putting together this conference. I, I appreciate being included. And, uh, and I especially appreciate the, the, the nod to, to Nancy. Uh, she was wonderful to work with. And uh, it just makes me smile whenever we think about her. And, uh, and now, now I'm going to go out with my three-year-old tomorrow and go out and play. So I, I uh, anyway. Um, so I appreciate that very much. I also wanted to um, say thanks to Joel Dunn uh, for his role in putting this together as well and congratulate him on uh, his recent Repi Award. He, he, he and I talked a little bit before uh, we, we came into the room and he uh, reminded me to make sure that I talk about things that are east of the Mississippi. Uh, he, he said, don't blame me for that. They won't be happy with me, but uh, I... Uh, but I, but but I may very well talk a little bit about East of the Mississippi here today. Um, I was going to do it anyway. It's not his fault. Um, so now the question is, why does DoD care about all this stuff? And uh, and from my perspective, it really boils down to this: DoD cares about its mission. We have a job to do, and that job has very little to do with with large landscape conservation. But it's not disconnected. Our job is to train and uh, train our soldiers to uh, get them ready to defend the country, uh, to maintain our bases, and, and to ensure that we can uh, answer the call when the, when the commander in chief uh, asks us to go. But in order to do that, there are some things you gotta do. You have to maintain those 28 million acres, not 28,000. Um, the, the, uh, it, it, and, you know, I, I, 20 million is a long, lot, uh, it, you know, depending on the records that we refer to, it's a little more, a little less. Um, I will say DOI is our largest landlord. Uh, they actually own m uh, more than half of that, and, and we have it withdrawn for military purposes. A lot of that's out west. Sorry, Joel. Um, the, the, uh, but in any case, um, the, that property, uh, we, we can't do what we need to do uh, unless we take care of that land. 
So there's a couple different pieces going on here. One is, uh, let me focus inside the fence and then I'll hit outside the fence. Inside the fence, we have uh, 400 endangered species on our bases. Uh, we have uh, several hundred more at-risk species. And we have a responsibility as federal, uh, parts of federal government to take care of those as we do our job. So as we blow stuff up, which we do, um, we, have to, we, we have to watch out for the habitat and watch out for the species and we have to take care of the species over here so we can blow stuff up over here. And, and, and that whole dynamic is, is very important to us because we have to continue to be able to use live fire operations, but in order to do that we need to make sure that we're doing what we're, we're meeting our responsibilities with regard to endangered species and taking care of the land and, and that way we get good biological opinions from fish and wildlife and everybody's happy. Um, the, uh, but that means that we spend a lot of money on this stuff. We spend a lot of money on taking care of red cockaded woodpeckers and gopher tortoises and desert tortoises and a whole host of other uh, items. And uh, the statistics that my folks have given me, see this is why it's useful to have these sheets. Um, is, is since 2003, almost a billion dollars of public and private funding has been put back in the local communities for, for some of the conservation work that we've done. That's the REPI program stuff, right? Yes. So, so, okay, so one more recognition. This is Kristen thomas -Gard. Kristen, stand up for a second. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see. She, Kristen is the heir to Nancy's legacy. She, she, is, she, is, um, she is doing the job that Nancy was doing when she passed away. And uh, she's doing a phenomenal job. And I have learned to listen to what Kristen says. So if anybody's looking to get money from us, go ask Kristen. Um, the, um, but let's go back to uh, but why we care about this stuff. So, so we are trying to do a job. Now that job involves taking care of things inside the fence, but it also take, involves taking care of things outside the fence. Why? Because we need buffer land around our bases in order to continue to do everything we need to do. Uh, we need uh, the environment uh, we need habitat off our bases, so it takes pressure of the, off the habitat inside our bases. It might surprise you to learn that we don't allow development inside our fence, um, whereas a lot of development does occur out, out, uh, out and about. And so as people come up to the fence line of whatever base we have, uh, they can't go any further, and then the species all come inside. And, and so uh, we have uh, the highest density of endangered species on our property across the federal government, across the, the, the major uh, land management agencies. You know, DOI, you know, it's a 20, it's, I can forgive the 28,000 comment, um, but, it, but even at 28 million, we are a, a poor little cousin compared to DOI. I mean, it, it, they, they are huge compared to us, and, uh, and we appreciate their partnership. The, um, but we do have, uh, density-wise, more, more endangered species uh, on our bases, and we, we have a thousand biologists who are, whose job it is to take care of, of these species, and so that we can do our job. It's all about mission. You know, um, a couple weeks ago, the Secretary of Defense put out a climate change adaptation roadmap. It was, it was geared, it got a little bit of press, and it was in a couple of uh, newspapers, and, uh, and it was our, my office's report, but what it was geared towards is we want to pay attention to climate change in order to continue to do our job. You know, there's a, there's a saying in the climate change community, uh, you want to manage the unavoidable and avoid the unmanageable. But, but at DOD, we also have to prepare for the possible. You know, w when a prospective future is out there, 10, 20, 30 years, um, and, and it's going to affect the natural resources on our bases, affect the behavior of those species that we're supposed to take care of in order to continue to blow stuff up. Um, that to, it, it, is, it is affecting how much water is available to our bases. Um, I have bases out west that are running out of water. What do I do when a base runs out of water? You know, do, you, do, you, do I move it? Well, I'm not allowed to, but the, the point being that <clears throat> there are real world effects on mission if we don't take things into account ahead of time. So let's go to uh, a conversation about what tools we have and what tools we use to, for, for those conservation activities, for the landscape. It's large landscape scale, but, uh, but even uh, place-based, parcel-based stuff. So uh, 11 years ago-ish, 12, 11, 12, um, we created a program called REPI. 
the Readiness Environmental Protection Initiative, which we've renamed to Readiness Environmental Protection Integration Program because everything has to be a program. Um, the, but, uh, but it was based on the principle that if we can contribute some funds to conserve lands that we need conserved around our bases, buffer land, species protection, um, and somebody else wants it protected for completely uh, uh, different reasons, uh, altruistic, let's say, um, we can each get what we want done for about half the cost if we split it evenly. And that appeals to all of our budgeteers. It appeals to the mission folks inside our bases. And the fact of the matter is, is it appeals to the conservation community as well. And so we have developed a wonderful partnership where we together look at our priority set and say, well, we want this land conserved. And somebody else says, well, OK, that's part of what I'm looking to conserve. And, and I can do it there, too, if I get more bang for my buck, no pun, uh, no pun intended. Um, and, and, uh, and we're able to basically leverage each other to accomplish more. And that was great. And we did that for many years. And as I alluded to earlier, I think the statistics I was uh, rattling off was close to a billion dollars in investment in this particular program over the last 10 or so years. The, um, that has achieved great things for us. We're very happy with it. And I think the, 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 our partners are pretty happy, too. On the other end of the spectrum, we're looking at these large landscapes where we know we have lots of bases across the southeast, lots of bases across the southwest. And how do we address the more holistic issues together with the states, with uh, our other federal partners? Uh, how do we all work together in a way that uh, enables us to protect our equities um, and leverage everybody else's effort on a broader scale? And so we can set up a couple of regional partnerships. There's something called the Western Regional Partnership that touches the Southwest states, something called Surpass, which is a, uh, touches the, the Southeast states. And I'll credit Bill Ross, who's sitting over there. And, and I should recognize Bruce Beard, too, who, who's hiding. And he made sure he wasn't sitting up in the front of the room. But, um, Bruce was, was there at the beginning uh, of the REPI program and deserves a lot of credit for its creation. But, uh, oh, <clears throat> well, now he's embarrassed. Now, now we got him turning red. So. Um, but in any case, um, as an aside, I, I came here from a retirement ceremony where somebody recognized you know, all the people in, in the room, basically. Um, and, and it takes a while. So I'm not trying to do that. Uh, but but as as my story unfolds, I can't help but point out a couple of people who happen to be here. So anyway, um, Sur Surpass and WRP have been great tools for us, and I'll, I'll use Surpass as as a as an example where we basically worked with our federal partners, with USDA and DOI, et cetera, et cetera, and our state partners, uh, you know, Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, um, Alabama, Mississippi, and if I forget anybody, I'm going to get in trouble, but I'm going to leave it there. Um, and, and developed things like the Longleaf uh, Strategic Plan. And there's a right name for it, but that's close enough. The, the, um, <clears throat> where we're, we're all gearing towards the same goal across the region. This is, I guess, a, a large landscape. Um, and that's what I was arguing to, to well, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so this, is, this, is, this is addresses a whole different side of the spectrum. But there was something in the middle, something missing. How do you get past the REPI model where you're looking at a parcel? and the surpass model where you're looking at a multiple state enterprise and get to something in the middle because we can't solve the problems that our bases, the buffer needs, the, uh, the, the encroachment problems that we have around our bases with just REPI. We don't have enough money. Even if we leverage that money, we don't have enough money. And so we had to start thinking creatively. That's when <clears throat> Nancy invented the REPI Challenge program. The REPI Challenge is, is sort of like REPI on steroids. It's, uh, it, it takes what is normally a REPI award and amps it up a bit. And we set aside $5 million for, for an award when the awards are normally much smaller and uh, open it up to competition from different regions. Hey, I've got an idea. Hey, I've got an idea. Well, I can bring, to get, I can bring $5 million to the table. Well, OK, well, I'll bring eight. Well, I'll bring 10. And so the, the point is, is that competition allowed us to leverage those dollars in a much larger way. And we, we were able to address mission in a much larger way <clears throat> and, and able to uh, hit more territory. But still. And, and Joel got one of those awards uh, this year. Fort Huachuca got uh, another one of the awards this, pa this past year. And I think uh, it was up at uh, Lewis McCord 
that got it the year before. Um, and at Lewis McCord, we were able to invest $4 million and get 12. That was pretty good. At Pax River, we invested $1 million to get eight. That was pretty good, too. I like this pattern. So, so in any case, we're able to address more with less uh, by putting up more. I, I, I think that's not inconsistent. I, that's not a self-contradictory statement. Um, and, and, but we still want more. So we're hungry for how do you fill the gap in between. And so we're starting to fill the spectrum from the parcel base. And we've got this, these models that are multi-state partnerships on the other end. How do we get to the middle of that? And that's when uh, last year we came up with something called Sentinel Landscapes. Sentinel Landscapes. Uh, is a concept that has been much debated in its specificity within my office. Kristen and I have debated it, and as, as I pointed out earlier, what Kristen says ends up being true, so she won the argument. Um, but I was thinking of it as much larger in scale, and she was saying, no, no, it's place-based, it's narrow here, and, and, and in the end, what we concluded was, these are the landscapes, the lands, that are bigger than a repi parcel, but are still the identified requirements for buffer around a particular location. Uh, at Pax River, what do I really need? Well, it's more than the parcel. It's more than the project we just did. It's much broader in scope, but it's not the whole Chesapeake Bay uh, watershed. It, it's, it's more narrow than that. So how do I identify the landscape that is standing sentinel? Yes, I know. It's not an acronym, though, so remember. Um, but, 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 um, but how do I identify that landscape, and how do I leverage? Well. In this partnership, when we identified the Lewis McCord project last year, uh, the Department of Interior and the Department of Agriculture both kicked in significant funds. That's how we got our three to one leverage. Um, they have committed to be part of this partnership and use the other tools that they have at their disposal across these requirements and to see what they can do to, to, to meet the, the defense needs as well. Because once again, it's like this big Venn diagram. We have this set of needs over here and, and everybody else has different parts of that, but there's an intersection where we can all contribute to an effort and all get more for less. And so what, I'm, what we're trying to get to here is how do I get more than a parcel, more than a big parcel around a base by leveraging other tools, by leveraging uh, protection of working lands, by leveraging conservation dollars, uh, uh, by, by bringing all that together in a focused effort. And what we found, in Pax River in particular, I'm going I'm to embarrass Joel by continuing to talk about this project, but, but, but what we found was by bringing our attention to an area that the state said, hey, you know, I want to be part of that, and other neighboring states said, well, I want to be part of that too, and they brought money to the table. <clears throat> People who are going to spend money anyway said, well, I, I'm going to spend it anyway, so I might as well spend it there, and we'll have a bigger project, a larger landscape. And, and it has uh, blossomed. It catalyzes activity, and, magne and, and it serves as a magnet for, for more. And it's not just about investments. It's about the other tools that we have at our disposal. And it has worked out really well. Now, I say it's worked out really well because it's just in its infancy. <laughs> But it has a lot of potential, and we're very excited about it. So <clears throat> I, uh, I have a, a rule of thumb. I, I, whenever you give a speech, it is my opinion that nobody remembers it a couple hours later. Um, so I, I have every expectation that people are going to forget exactly what I said, because you have your coffee and your dessert and everything, although you're really all paying attention. That's really good. Um, the, the, so I have to come up with a couple things I want you to remember. Number one, DOD actually does give a, does care uh, uh, about landscape conservation. My, my other uh, set of, of rules of public speaking is I have two main rules. One, don't make news. I think I succeeded. And two, never use profanity, which I really come close to sometimes. Um, but anyway, DOD cares uh, about large landscape conservation. This is a very important thing to us, but why do we care? We care because we care about mission, and it is relevant. It is not just some, you know, oh, yes, I'm being told to spend money on this. No, this is important for us to do our job. DOD does care about that. It is important. So that's one. Two, if you have discretion in all of your large landscapes and you have a place that's near a military base and a place that's not near a military base, do your conservation over next to us because we are pretty good partners when all is said and done and I have some money. <laughs> and remember, Kristen is going to tell me where to spend it. 
but it's important. But 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 we can all, you know, if we see somebody doing something constructive near one of our bases and it's important to us, we may very well want to jump in on that too. It'll help compete for Rappi Challenge dollars, and not even when you're doing Rappi Challenge, we're going to be able to do just normal traditional Rappi dollars in that direction. Heck. There may be state, multi-state partnerships that we haven't conceived of that we may want to create, although those suck up a lot of my time, and I will say that when all is said and done, I don't need too, too many of those that I have to do you know, across the country, but that's beside. Anyway, I'm, I'm open-minded. If you have ideas, let's talk about it, because what we want to do in the end, I guess this is the third point. So one, we care. Two, put your, put your projects near us, and three, um, really, for me, it's, it's all about mission, and it is consistent. So anyway, thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate being here. Okay, so I believe, I'm looking over at the AV booth, we have a couple of mic runners in the audience. Um, are there... If anybody has a question at this point, can you raise your hand or stand up? You see, see one right here? I see one over here. Right here, okay. Go ahead and, uh, sir, go ahead and ask your question. I'll repeat it since you don't have a mic. You want to repeat the question? Yeah, okay. Um, so the question was, uh, Repi is all well and good, but when you build stuff that wrecks uh, our, our uh, conser conservation areas, that's worse. So, so, and we're talking about a, a site in Maine where there may or may not be a, a missile interceptor site located. Um, uh, there's a reason we have NEPA. And we look at all this stuff before we actually do any construction or locate a project. Um, trust me, we spend a lot of time on NEPA, and, and, and that's a good thing. And, and so I think that um, if we found that there was a particularly bad site from an environmental perspective that we would be looking for other locations. That's just the, the way business is done. Um, I hope that we're not going to do that, but, but that particular project, if I recall correctly, if, I'm, if it's the one I'm thinking of, is some years off. And so there's plenty of time to, to, to figure out the, a better location, if it is. I, I actually, because of time, and I see people already rushing to get ready for their presentations, am going to wrap this up. But thank uh, Mr. Conger for an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. That was great.